Hi guys, this is your host, Chris Vetrano, and I hope that you guys are all having a great summer so far. Man, it's hot out there, isn't it? Um, this last weekend, I went to Nashville Pride, and I literally only went to see, as you guys know, I'm friends with Cassidy Pope, who's been on the pod a couple of times, actually, a friend of the pod, um, and we went to see her, and I was there for her, like, hour long set right like she would did an hour and by the end of it i was dripping wet like i never have been before and it wasn't just because she teased her new song almost there though that had a had a lot to do with it um but no it is hot out there so i hope that you guys are all surviving and hopefully listening to this poolside because that's where i want to be um but this week we're doing something a little bit different um there's been so many new listeners over the last month to two months and um, it really got me thinking that some of my early episodes might be lost for you you may not have dug into the archives the way that i need you to and so i wanted to bring out an interview that i did that was literally a dream come true. It was um, early on when I decided that I was going to do this podcast, I had a conversation with my husband and uh, he asked me, like, who would you want to have if you were going to have guests? And, you know, I was like, well, I mean, obviously my favorite movie of all time is Clueless. So I was like, either Elisa Donovan or Alicia Silverstone would be amazing. And then I started talking about Elisa Donovan and how she was also in 90210 and she was in the NSYNC videos and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And she had this huge, huge role in so many of the things that I watched and that I listened to and that I did. And she was so influential for me. So it was early on that I was like, she would be one of my dream guests. So I put her on a list and, you know, I, I was reaching out to various folks to start getting uh, guests lined up for this. And I could not believe when I heard back and that she was willing to do this interview with me. It was truly, truly, truly one of the greatest days of my life. I was so nervous to do it. Uh, the, the cold intro that I do, <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't believe I did it in front of her. Um, but it just, it, it was such a wonderful thing and I've been able to like really continue to kind of follow everything that she's doing. And, you know, I feel very fortunate that, you know, hopefully we'll get to have even more conversation in the future. But, um, but yeah, I realized that there was a lot of you that may have not ever heard this interview. And so I wanted to bring it back out. Like I said, I hope you're poolside. I hope you're ready for a great conversation because also, you know, I talk about, um, all the things that Elisa has done. And she's been so influential in pop culture of the roles that she's played. But she also wrote this book about uh, losing her father and the way in which she stays sort of connected uh, to him. And we ended up going into this like really deep personal place where I started sharing about the loss of my mother. And, you know, it was just, it, it went to a place that I never really imagined that it would. Um, and I'm so, so grateful again that she did it. And so um, I wanted to give you guys uh, this as a refresh uh, listen. And so if you've heard it, you know, please listen again, because um, like I said, it was a really, really great conversation. And if you haven't, I'm so excited for you to hear it. Um, but yeah, so we're going to we're gonna go back into the archives and play this interview with Elisa Donovan. I hope that you guys enjoy it. And like I said, I hope you're enjoying your summers and that you guys are staying cool in this crazy heat. And um, until next week, uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Don't forget, you can follow me on socials at CM Vetrano. Um, and I'll be right there to hear your reactions to this dream come true interview. So have a great summer, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, so you're probably going, is this an Oxima commercial or what? But actually, it's The Gist, and I'm your host, Chris Vetrano. 
here to share everything happening in entertainment and revisiting the biggest moments from pop culture's past. Today, we have an iconic guest that defined a generation of pop culture moments. She was a star of one of my favorite movies of all time, Clueless. She also starred in Sabrina the Teenage Witch, A Night at the Roxbury, appeared on my favorite TV series of the 90s, Beverly Hills 90210, and drove Joey Fatone crazy in NSYNC's I Drive Myself Crazy video. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough, she's also a director, the author of Wake Me When You Leave, and just starred in an incredible new Super Bowl ad for Rakuten. Please give a Hey Ambular to my guest, Elisa Donovan. Hi. Intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this. This is like, honestly, a dream come true. I don't want to gush too much because I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but you were like... <laughs> Such a staple of for mine growing up. I watched Clueless all the time. I watched the series. Obviously, uh, Ginger LaMonica on 90210, I thought needed to be a regular. Um, so I, I, know, I know the catalog, and uh, it's oh so gosh. great to have you here doing this today. Oh, I love it. Well, it's my pleasure. I mean, you know, it's nice to be so appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. I... Um, I, so you just did the Super Bowl ad, revisiting Amber. So tell me, like, how was it sort of stepping back into her shoes after all this time? Well, it, it was surprisingly easy, <laughs> although uh, so I'm not sure if that's a positive or a negative. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that that character is just so embedded in me. And anytime I try to forget about it, someone reminds me. So it's always, <laughs> let's try to forget about it, but you know what I mean? It's a, yeah. it's very present for a lot of people, that film. So it just felt really fun uh, yeah. to step back into that as a grown up. And, um, sure. you know, I mean, looking over at Alicia and she's in her yellow plaid and they recreated that set virtually to a T. It was, um, it was surreal. I mean, we were kind of laughing going, where, how, where are we? What is happening yeah. right now? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like, it seemed like it was <clears throat> exactly the scene from the movie and you guys both look incredible. And I was like very much believing that it was just footage that was left on the cutting room floor from back in the I day. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was so great. Um, and then, so I, I was looking up your credits and before Clueless, you had done two episodes of Blossom and was like, so was Clueless like your real, like first big break after that? Oh yes, for sure. That um, and Blossom was the first TV job that I had in LA and um, they had hired me for one episode and then they loved the chemistry that Joe, I was playing opposite Joey Lauren mm -hmm. and they just loved the chemistry that we had. So they wrote in a wrote me in another episode and then they were going to continue to write me in. And then I got the film of clueless. So I couldn't go back to blossom. Um, and yeah, that's how it all happened. That's that's amazing. I mean, because Amber is like such an iconic character. I mean, she defined fashion. She was like, she had her own lingo. She was just, she was so, such a crazy character that yeah. people remember so much. I mean, obviously, like the um, Alicia is like, you know, the yellow plaid, as you mentioned, is like this like iconic look. But I feel like Amber was like the fashion queen. And yeah. I, I mean, you, so did you feel like that was a natural role for you? Do you align with Amber or was that something different for you to play? So I aligned with her in, in, in the sense that she's an innovator and kind of on her own program. I think that her, her focus and her concerns are a little different than mine, yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do love clothing and I love fashion and I always, I'm a bit untraditional in that sense. So I really mm -hmm. kind of focused in on that yeah. with her. I think that, uh, you know, the, the costume designer, Mona May, was absolutely incredible. And Lisa Evans, who was her uh, associate at the time, and Lisa has a very big career now for herself as well. And we, they just created such incredible, full, fully realized outfits, right? So the idea yeah. was always that Amber is going to take something off the runway in Paris and mm -hmm. wear it to English class and yeah. then <laughs> always have it reflect 
what she's feeling, you know? Oh, she's yeah. feeling like she'd rather be on her yacht today. So she's going to wear a yachting, you know, <laughs> just, which I also identify with that feeling of, I like clothing to reflect how I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, definitely. Amber just really had, uh, she, she did that to the nines. <laughs> yeah, she did. It was, yeah, it was, like I said, I mean, there's so many quotable lines and I feel like Amber is responsible for so many of them. And she- so <laughs> it was, I'm sure that you get them all the time, just across the street, people yelling them at you. Yes. Like I just sort of did in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely, it's kind of, you know, she didn't have a lot to say in the film, but what she said, nobody forgets. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, how is, uh, I mean, I know your daughter's starting to get, get older. How is she, has she seen the film? What is her sort of thoughts of like mom being this iconic character? So she has not seen the film. I still think oh. she's a little bit young. She's 10. Yeah. Um, but I'm a little more conservative than a lot of people in terms of what we let her watch. But um, I think she's probably in a year or two, maybe she can yeah. watch it. So she she sort of just understands it from the standpoint of what other people say to her. <laughs> and yeah. so even with the commercial, she said, you're doing this, whatever with your hands. And I said, it's a thing that people, you know, like me to do. And that was a part. So she, it's all, I mean, look, the only thing that she cares about is that now I am associated in some way with, with the Super Bowl, yeah, <laughs> and also with the Golden State Warriors because Rakuten is the main sponsor for the Warriors, and yeah. she, we are huge Warriors fans, but she is a huge sports fan and a very big Warriors fan, and so we, um, they very graciously allowed us to have their courtside seats for the Warriors game the other night, and that yeah. just like changed my daughter's life so now she loves that i am you know an Doing actress that. but she doesn't <laughs> really just because of how it benefits her yeah I'm well sure. that makes sense i mean <laughs> yeah she um i saw your i saw the story of her getting to meet the players oh, and stuff and that was, that was really incredible. sweet incredible and we have this picture of her where Clay Thompson is high-fiving her and you just see her face <laughs> light up in this way like oh well, she just couldn't believe it yeah that's amazing that's amazing well um i'm sure that once she does see it and you know you are right like i saw it probably probably too young like in in retrospect but (laughs) i didn't get most of the like jokes that i now i see like oh that movie was like maybe a little more uh risque than i thought it was but uh but at the time it kind of went over my head i was i wasn't really noticing but um (laughs) i always we talk a lot on this podcast about the real housewives i don't know if that's something that you uh, dip Uh, your toe into at all i don't but but, you know, I do Jeff Lewis's show, Jeff uh-huh. Lewis, I have his, his, um, and, and he's a friend. And I know that I am sort of the opposite kind of a guest for them because yeah. they, they, he has had a lot of people like that. And my friend <laughs> yeah. who is often on, on, um, as a co-host with Jeff, he is a huge fan. So I have, whenever I've stayed with Doug, he has, uh, made me watch a couple of episodes yeah, but I still well, don't. I haven't retained any of it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, de- I definitely have like had the thought where I was like, if what would Amber be doing today? And I feel like she would be a real housewife for 100%. sure. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So you know, maybe think about it. I might ask you at the end, but like, if Amber had a Real Housewives tagline, I would love to know if you have thoughts of what that might actually be. But I know I'm putting you on the spot, so yeah, we. Can. You, you might have to think about that one, but I, I think that she would be epic for that. Um, also, I mentioned that uh, you were also on uh, Beverly Hills 90210, obviously the bad girl best friend of Valerie Malone. Um, that was like, that must have been like a crazy character. I mean, unlike Amber, she was like more of a vixen, um, but still kind of the bad girl, obviously. So how was that? Was that a fun character to play? She- Oh my gosh, Ginger. She was a ball. I always look at that character like, gosh, if I had an ounce of her confidence and she has got balls, you know, like she just would, she did whatever she wanted. And I think she was, you know, she's like a scrapper. She was like, I'm going to, I'm going to take everything I want here. I'm going to utilize this situation. And, um, I mean, I think everything, like she got high, she Mm -hmm. slept with everyone. She stole things from everyone. (laughs) 
she, you know, I think she blackmailed Valerie too. Like yeah. I don't even, I just thought, oh man, she blackmailed is, her she in order to break funny. up her and yeah. David. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, um, I always was like, I feel like Ginger needs to be like a regular cast member. Like she has so much story that we haven't like gotten into. And so that was always my dream with that would be that you would come back and, oh, and be a regular. I loved that show. It was really, it was so much fun doing that. I feel like I've been really fortunate in terms of the, the casts and the groups of people that I've worked with. They, it was just a joy. Jason Priestley, like what mm -hmm. a lovely human. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you worked, I mean, Beverly Hills was obviously such a, another iconic show and like it changed, revolutionized kind of pop culture in so many ways. They had their own Barbie mm -hmm. dolls and they had everything, lunch boxes and all the things. And, you know, Clueless was in the same, like, geez, does that resonate to you as like, uh, you know, the, a star of one of these, uh, of these major films and, and TV shows that you were part of this like huge pop culture shift. I mean, I don't know how else to, it's just like a part, it's just how my life has been. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So I don't yeah. know how to, how uh, it would be to not be a part yeah. of it. So well, it, again, and you started so so early with Clueless, like being like one of the first films or the first film. And, you know, so obviously it's like that probably just became second like nature. Yeah, I feel like I have I have have been very fortunate to be a part of so many of these things that really have imprinted themselves on uh and pop culture. I mean Sabrina and Clueless and mm -hmm. 90210 like all of those things. It's I feel very fortunate to have worked on so many things that people that really, you know, have stuck with people and mm -hmm. um it's nice. It's it's great. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to imagine that like those, the cast of those groups, like, because it was such a movement, like, do you guys stay in touch? Like, how does that, I mean, does it feel like when you were on the shooting the ad, was it like feeling like homecoming week? I mean, <laughs> I hadn't seen Alicia in a bunch of years. We, over the years, we've had a couple of things to do always, you know, surrounding an anniversary or something. Mm -hmm. And when my daughter was a baby and her son was maybe a year and a half old, we had to do this photo shoot. And I think maybe I, I saw her once after that, um, but I really hadn't kept in touch with her. Donald Faison, I keep in touch with, mm -hmm. and, you know, we message each other from time to time. And, um, uh, and I was at his wedding and, um, but I keep in touch with Melissa, Joan Hart, mm -hmm. and a lot of people from that cast, and David Lasher, who was on Sabrina and was also on Clueless, the series, and mm -hmm. who else? Nobody. Jason, once in a while, too, I we communicate. We did another project together that he directed this web series, um, which the name is escaping me. It was a bunch of years ago now too. And that was really fun because he, he directed me and I played, you know, one of the grown ups. It was a show about young kids. And yeah. Um, so he's, That's... he's terrific. I keep in touch with him a little bit too. Yeah. I, in my mind, like everyone's on a group chat and you we're all hanging like, out oh. all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, uh, you're going to Melrose. We do have a Sabrina chat. We do actually. Okay. There is a, yeah. uh, that it isn't all the time, but whenever, you know, we have something that we want everybody to know about, or when, if we do like a reunion thing in the pandemic, we did this reunion event for charity and, um, yeah, and I'm doing 90s con with Alicia and Stacy in March. And oh, amazing. The Sabrina, I think that um I think Brecken is doing it as well. I'm not 100% certain on that. And um but the cast of Sabrina will be there too, so we're trying to, you know, merge. A yeah. Little. It's that fun. sounds amazing. Yeah, nineties con. That sounds like exactly where I should be. I yeah, it sounds I'm like that gonna... is where you should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually just I just learned about it just now. So now oh, I'm like my... probably gonna be Googling it after. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, amazing. Um, well, I also want to talk about your book because mm -hmm. um and it's also becoming a film that you're gonna direct. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So so I lost my mother to terminal cancer when I was 18. So oh. I really resonated when I like saw what the book was about and I went through and, you know, I, I started to like pull some quotes that I was like going to want to read for the podcast. And then I was like, no, I want to, you know, not cry in front of Elisa. 
Um, but like I was reading like the letter that you wrote your dad and it was like mm-hmm. reminding me of, you know, things at times where it's like, you want to say those last few things that you never got to say. And I've never thought about writing a letter uh, to my mom. And you kind of gave me that like thought that like, now I want to do that exercise because it's such a healing thing. And, you know, I, I want you to kind of tell what came or how the book came to be, because I feel like I get visited from my mom in different ways. Um, and so I, again, I just like, when I saw what you were writing about, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait. And I, you know, so I started going, getting into the reading of it and it's, it's just amazing the storytelling. Um, but for folks listening, tell us a little bit about like what the book is and how you came to write it. Mm -hmm. Um, first, I'm so sorry. That's really young to lose your mom. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it like decimated me and I was 30 or 31. So I, I, I feel for you. Um, so the book, you know, all of these things happened at one time. My dad was diagnosed with cancer. Sabrina was canceled and I did not get another job. You know, I tested what's called screen testing Mm -hmm. for all these pilots did not get a job. And then my relationship ended with the person I thought I was going to marry. And then my dad died. So sort of all of these things that made my life make sense were just systematically removed. And I had quite literally nothing to hold on to. And it made me reevaluate my whole life and my entire path and what I really wanted and, and what mattered to me and how I wanted to spend not only my, my, my time, but my, my creative life and my creative time, like what was really my purpose being here. And, um, the book is really about the grief process and then how, how unexpected all of that was for me. And also how so much of the healing came from these otherworldly sorts of experiences with my dad and uh, the dreams in particular that he came to me in, um, they're just extraordinary. And, you know, anyone that has had this kind of visitation dream knows what I'm talking about. It's, it's very different than I have a very active dream life and I, there are a lot of dreams in the book, but these, these visitation ones are so distinct and, and so, so different and really powerful. And it just opened up something in me that helped me to understand how, when someone we love dies, they don't really leave us. It just changes. The relationship changes. And for me, that was really healing and revelatory. I mean, I honestly feel as though my relationship with my dad is closer now than it was when he was alive, you know, and, Oh, since you can see that all over. There's, there's, there's dad. (laughs) Sometimes he's also laughing a lot do <laughs> things like that. Yeah, that's that's okay. amazing. Well, that that's dad. I mean, that's yeah. there he is yeah. saying hello. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. um no, in that was something that I thought you did so well in the book was really def- defining and describing the grief process. Like I remember mm-hmm. when you you talk about like laying on the shower floor for like sometimes 40 minutes just letting the water rush over you and you know that is like such a way of like describing that grief process is like sometimes you just like and life goes on and so those moments in the shower and things like that like are the ones that you sort of have to hold on to because you know obviously I don't I wasn't amber and clueless so I you know when I had my moments on the street crying people weren't coming up and asking if they could take photos with me uh, like they were with you but you know you you talk even in that story that you told about the woman that came up and like wasn't understanding that you were saying like, Hey, I'm like in the middle of, you Mm -hmm. know, a a grief process and going through like a hard time. She was kind of unaware, Mm -hmm. but that was, it resonated to me because it was this like, well, life goes on and the people around you are not aware of the things that you're feeling when you're going through the grief. And And so it was amazing. And that's so disorienting because it's so present with you, right? That it feels like, it's written all over your face, right? Or it's just written all over your body. So everybody has to see it and, and they don't, but it's like, that's how intensely it feels. And it, it, it becomes, it it feels sometimes impossible to get through the world. And, uh, 
you know, I it, it's so isolating. And I, I became really aware of how resistant we are to in our culture to talking about difficult things like this. And yeah. it's hard to be vulnerable in that way and intimate with people. It's really difficult because it it feels like this weight, like it's just too much, you know, it's too much for anyone to handle. And um, I just I felt as though we, I, I want to somehow help us to shift this. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, and you're doing that with the book. Like, I mean, I think I'm, I urge people to go read it because it does. And especially if you've gone through something like this and, you know, I've, I've had friends also that have, you know, said like, well, that have lost loved ones or uh, friends or family. And, you know, they're like, well, I don't, I don't know that I've ever felt that visitation or, you know, when I tell them stories about things and I'm like, it probably is happening. You just have to be more aware of it. Yeah. And I think the more that like we talk about it and share each other's stories, like you become more aware of those things too. around you. Cause I think oftentimes there's something that we were resisting it, but we don't even realize it. And sometimes that resistance comes from, it's too painful, right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to think about it. And so if I open myself up to that, it's just going to hurt too much. And that was the feeling that I had in the first dream that I had with my dad. When I woke up, I felt incapacitated, like, oh my God, I do not know how to function now. Like now I really feel this, but what winds up happening is it just opened, it opened me in a way that allowed me to process my grief and to let him in and let mm -hmm. other people in and, um, to not be so, so scared of, of pain, you know, yeah. when people I've unfortunately know two, two people who lost children in, in the last two years. And that is just, I can't even think about that in my own, mm -hmm. like, it's just as a parent, it is just the absolute worst thing that you can yeah. imagine. And, you know, I think while that grief, I think is very specific and different to any other kind of grief. Um, the thing that I think is most helpful to the, the, to, to my, my friends in particular has been to allow them to talk about it mm -hmm. and to, to be unafraid of their pain, to just yeah. hold it for them. And, you know, in one case that the, the child has become a guy He's around me all the time, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not a medium. I'm not a, that's not, I, it's just, it's a very a specific, I feel such a closeness to this child. And I, I think it's just because I'm very open to it and I feel, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't scare me. I don't, yeah. um, I, I, I welcome it and it feels like it's very, uh, healing for people, you know, cause it feels like so fine. Death is so final. Everyone Absolutely. feels that way, but you know, I've learned that it just isn't, it's final in the physical form. Yes. Like my dad's not sitting here having a cup of coffee with me, but sometimes I'm like, mm, he's having a cup of coffee. With yeah. Me. <laughs> and you know, and you write the letter and you kind of have this like piece of knowing that like he's read it, like he's got it. And he's yes. like feeling that even in, and yeah. really you didn't even have to put those words on paper because he felt mm -hmm. them already, mm -hmm. but it's like, I think it's such a great thing. And so I know that, um, I know you're busy and I, and I feel like I could talk to you about this all day because I really, truly, I you know, I, know. I, so, I didn't know you had such a connection to this. So I, I really, it, it, yeah, yeah, I appreciate I, you sharing it with me. Yeah, I was when I uh, when I started looking at the book, and I was like, "Oh, well, like I'm so interested in this." And and similarly, like I never felt like I was a medium or things, but um, I did see one, and and she had said to mm -hmm. me, "Like you're you're intuitive, like you yes. have those yes. feelings." Yes. And I was like, "Well, I mean, I've thought things before," and she's like, "No, those are those are real things." Yes, yes. and it's <laughs> such an amazing thing. So so tell us um, because I know you're going to have to go, but um, tell us a little bit about like the film and like what's the next thing that you've got going on so that we can you know continue to to talk about it. Yes, yeah, so the film version of the book is in development, and what that means is I have written the script and I am attached to directing it, and we have half about half of the cast attached so far. And I have a wonderful producer who has um, been to Sundance many times and won awards at Sundance. Amazing. And, um, 
we are raising the financing. So putting together the the final financing now. So we're hoping that we'll be able to shoot by the end of the year. Cool. So um, that's, that's the plan. Yeah. Well, you know, hopefully like maybe when the film comes out, maybe you'll come back and, yeah, and we can talk yes. more about it because, you know, like I said at the beginning, this is like a dream come true. You were like such a, like, pivotal part of so many things that I loved growing up. And then, and it really felt like almost, it almost felt like a gift from my mom when I saw your book Mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, I already feel connected. Cause when I started this podcast, I just have to tell you, I, uh, my husband asked me like, well, who would be one of your dream guests? And you were one of the first people that I said, because I was like, she was in all of these things. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I I need to just wrap it up because I have done it now. Like you were, you were the MVP (laughs) here. So, um, but really I am so, so grateful. And, you know, I am that girl on the street now who you've just made (laughs) the day and, you know, I appreciate you being here and everything that you have given to pop culture. Oh, Chris, this has been an absolute pleasure. Truly. Thank you so much for having me and for sharing all of that. And where can people find you online? What your socials are? Yes. So Instagram is Red Donovan and Twitter is Red Donovan. And I think TikTok is the same. TikTok is a newer thing. So forgive me. I don't really know how to do it, but I've done a couple of things that people seem to like on there. And um, Facebook is Elisa Donovan. They all have the little blue check mark. Perfect. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of imposters out there. So make sure you're following the right one, but yeah. And, um, I did see the TikToks. I have a little something special to go along with this, uh, with, uh, this episode that I oh, really? used one of your TikToks for. So, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but like I said, yeah. Uh, but like I said, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I definitely hope that we get to chat again. Um, and, uh, for everyone listening, uh, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow Elisa. And like I said, get the book because it is so, it could be life changing for you. And, um, it certainly has been for me. And, uh, and yeah, don't forget to rate and subscribe uh, so you never miss an episode of The Gist. Uh, I have been Chris Vetrano and living my dreams right here. So you guys go do that. Have a great week. And thanks so much for tuning in.